So good morning, everyone. So we'll begin as usual by reciting some prayers. Then uh, we'll generate a positive motivation and I'll lead a short meditation on um, what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks to try to get more uh, understanding of it. So during the prayers, uh, it's good if you can to imagine the Buddha in front of you, made of light, very beautiful, blissful, radiant, and have the feeling of Buddha's compassion. Feel that you are totally accepted, loved, cared for by the Buddha with his vast, immeasurable, unconditional compassion for you and every other living being that is unending. It's always there every minute, every second, no matter what we do. Even if we get caught up in negative attitudes and do negative things, the Buddha never gives up having compassion for us, always accepting and forgiving. So he's just totally dedicated to being there for us and doing whatever can be done to help us be free of suffering, help us reach the peaceful, blissful state that he has reached. <clears throat> and if you wish, you can imagine other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the space around. <clears throat> Don't worry about having a perfect, clear visualization. Just try to feel that they're there. And then as we take refuge and generate bodhicitta, you, you can also imagine all other living beings around you taking refuge along with you. If that's too difficult, then don't worry about it. But um, that helps open up our mind, our heart to others so that we're not just thinking about oneself, this one person we are, but thinking of other living beings who have so much suffering, especially right now, there's so many troubles in the world, so many people suffering, other living beings as well in other realms having suffering. So really try to open your heart to all those beings, wish all of them be, to be free of their suffering and the causes of suffering and help them all find their way to liberation and eventually to enlightenment. <clears throat> I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. <clears throat> Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence 
and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Then we'll recite the mantra of the Buddha a few times while reciting it. You can imagine light flowing from the Buddha into yourself and into all other living beings. <clears throat> the light fills our bodies and minds. It purifies all our suffering, physical and mental, and the causes of suffering, our afflictive emotions and karma. So imagine being completely purified. And the light also nourishes our positive potential. <clears throat> all the imprints and seeds of positive states of mind so that they can grow more and more and turn into enlightened qualities like love and compassion and wisdom and so forth. <clears throat> If you don't already have a clear altruistic intention as your motivation for being here and joining this session, <clears throat> then bring into your mind whatever um, altruistic intention works best for you. If you're comfortable with the idea of attaining enlightenment, becoming a fully enlightened Buddha, to benefit all living beings, then you can bring that into your mind. But if that seems too big or vast or far away, or you're not sure about your ability to attain that, then you can think that you would like to learn something here today that will help you develop your positive potential, your positive qualities, so that you can make your life more and more helpful beneficial for other living beings and for the world. So recently, 
We've been looking at the topic of the 12 links of dependent arising. <clears throat> so this explains the process by which we remain stuck in samsara, cyclic existence, dying and taking rebirth over and over again, kind of like being stuck on a Ferris wheel or a merry-go-round going around and around through all the different realms of samsara and experiencing many different problems. So why are we stuck in this situation? Why can't we get out of this situation? So it's mainly because of these 12 links. So let's just go through these and try to get a better understanding of how they work. So the first link is ignorance. Ignorance that sees oneself and everyone else and everything else as inherently existing or independently existing, having a way of existing that's completely false. Nothing exists that way. And yet we see things as existing that way and we believe in that, we buy into it. <clears throat> so our mind is, and our, and our whole experience is dominated by that mistaken perception, mistaken um, way of seeing everything. And then because of this, we get caught up in other afflictive emotions, such as attachment to ourself and those who seem to bring us happiness and aversion and hostility towards those who seem to make us suffer. Many other afflictive emotions as well, like arrogance and jealousy and so on. And sometimes these aff afflictive emotions come up in our mind in such a strong way that they motivate us to do non-virtuous actions doing harmful things to others, even killing or stealing, telling lies, speaking harsh words, and so forth. So if this action is a complete action with all the four parts, the four aspects complete, then it becomes link number two. Uh, karmic formation or compositional action, meaning <clears throat> it has the power to cause another rebirth. And since it's a non-virtuous action, then it will cause a rebirth in an unfortunate place, unfortunate realm, like as an animal or as a hungry ghost or in hell, depending on the severity of the action. So an imprint of that action is left on our consciousness and gets carried by the consciousness through time. And if we don't do anything to purify that karmic imprint, it's possible that at the end of this life or at the end of some other future life, as we are dying, craving and grasping arise, and those have the effect of nourishing that karmic seed, that karmic imprint, so it becomes empowered and able to throw the next life, to cause the next life. <clears throat> and because the original action was a non-virtuous one, the next life will be an unfortunate one in a suffering realm. So then right after death, after the consciousness leaves the present body, and it will go and take a new body in one of, in one of those unfortunate realms. And then the remaining links will arise, name and form, six sources, contact and feeling, as well as birth, 
aging and death. So we'll have another life, another rebirth in this unfortunate realm, where we'll have a lot of suffering and problems. And during that life, we'll probably create even more uh, actions, karmic actions to cause yet more rebirths in samsara. And when we're in the lower realms, the unfortunate realms, because our mind is strongly dominated by afflictive emotions, attachment and um, anger and so forth, we'll probably just create more negative karma, non-virtuous karma. <clears throat> and that's why it's so unfortunate to be born in those realms. Not only do we have a lot of suffering, but we continue creating the causes for even more suffering, more rebirths in unfortunate states. But even in the case of virtuous karma, when under the influence of ignorance, we do something positive and virtuous like generosity, ethical conduct and so forth, so that kind of karmic imprint brings about a rebirth in a fortunate situation, like as a human being or as a deva. But we're still in samsara. It's still another rebirth in an unfortunate, unsatisfying situation. We'll have a lot of suffering, a lot of problems. Will still be under the control of ignorance and afflictions. Will still cre continue creating karma for yet more rebirths within samsara. So even as we are experiencing the results of one uh, karmic action, like link number two, we are creating more all the time. So really try to get a sense of how unfortunate, unsatisfying, how awful it is to be in this situation, to be in samsara and experiencing all the different problems of samsara and unknowingly creating the cause for even more experiences within samsara, more rebirths, more suffering, more problems. So see if you can get a sense of how unbearable this situation is and feel the wish to be free of it. <clears throat> so the topic of the 12 links is a complicated one. You may feel like you don't fully understand it, but normally it does take time to understand it. So it's good to get teachings on it, read it, study it, think about it more and more, and slowly it'll start to make more sense. So we just don't have the time in this class to, you know, go into it in more depth. So we're going to move on today. Um, so just a couple more things about the 12 links, um, how to cease them. So if you could put up the slides. <clears throat> Uh, 
So the point of learning about and reflecting on the 12 links is to generate this strong sense of renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara. And we do need to recognize how unfortunate, how undesirable, how unsatisfying this situation is. Even though there are pleasant experiences in samsara, no, that's that's uh, definitely the case. But those pleasant experiences don't last. They're temporary. They're transitory. They're like a rainbow or like a bubble. They're there for a short time and then they disappear. And we're left still in this very unsatisfying situation that we have no control over. So it's really important to get a sense of how samsara is, really is unbearable. And we don't deserve to be here. We deserve to be free and then generating that strong determination to free ourselves because nobody else can do it for us. Buddha can't do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. So we need this strong you know, determination to get ourselves out. Okay, so if you could show the next slide. So this is a quotation from the Rice Seedling Sutra um, which seems to be the main sutra used in the Mahayana tradition to understand the 12 links. Um, but they're also explained in many Pali sutras. So this explains how to cease the 12 links. It says, with the cessation of ignorance, formational action ceases. With the cessation of formational action, consciousness ceases. When it says consciousness ceases, that doesn't mean the whole of our mind goes out of existence. <laughs> it just means that moment of consciousness, which gets imprinted with um, the karmic seed to cause um, for uh, future rebirths in samsara. So that particular link of consciousness ceases, but we still have consciousness, we still have mind. And then with the cessation of consciousness, name and form cease. With the cessation of name and form, the six sources cease, and so on. So it goes through one by one. With, with the cessation of the previous link, the following one ceases. And then eventually we come to the last one, birth. And then it says, and the cessation of birth brings the cessation of aging and death, sorrow, lamentation misery, unhappiness, and conflict. So the whole range of different kinds of sufferings and problems that occur in samsara, all of those will cease, all those will stop. This entire great heap of suffering will cease in that way. This the Blessed One calls dependent arising. So basically what this is saying is, if we want to eliminate um, the 12 links and our situation of dying and being reborn in samsara over and over again, we have to start with the first link, ignorance. If we eliminate that, then we can stop all the others. And to eliminate ignorance, to make ignorance cease, we need to gain the wisdom that realizes emptiness because emptiness means things do not exist inherently, independently, as ignorance sees them. So the wisdom realizing emptiness is the opposite state of mind to ignorance. So it's the exact antidote to ignorance. When we can develop this wisdom realizing emptiness, then it like pulls the rug out from under ignorance. Ignorance has nothing to stand on anymore. So that's how ignorance ceases. And then like a domino effect, you know, the rest will, will cease as well. But it's not easy <laughs> to um, develop that wisdom realizing emptiness to eliminate ignorance. It does take time, but we can at least start. We can just learn about emptiness as much as we can study it, meditate on it, and slowly our understanding of emptiness will increase. But in the meantime, there's some other things we can do. 
So the next slide mentions a few other practical things we can start doing now um, about these 12 links. So one is to avoid creating non-virtuous karma and create virtuous karma as much as we can, because we probably will continue to be in samsara for a number of lifetimes before we get out. So at least make sure that we're creating the causes for fortunate rebirths rather than unfortunate ones. Really make sure we keep ourselves out of the lower realms because once we're there, it's very hard to get out. But at least, especially a human life, we have a human rebirth and the opportunities to again, learn the Dharma and practice the Dharma. Then we can continue um, traveling the path that leads out of samsara. So, and then the second point, do purification practice to purify non-virtuous karma created in the past. So it's a good idea to do purification practice every day, um, even not just once a day, twice a day, as much as you can, because we want to make sure we clear up the negative karma created in the past and any additional negative karma we create in the present. And it's also important to learn how to manage our mind and our emotions, because when we come to the end of our life, we're leaving this life and on our way to the next life, the state of mind we have at the time of death plays a role in what kind of karma will ripen. We have lots of karmic seeds in our mind that could cause the next rebirth. And we want to make sure that one of one of our virtuous karmic seeds will ripen for, for, our, for a fortunate rebirth in the next life. So the state of mind we have at that time will affect that. So we want to make sure we die in a positive state of mind, having faith, having love, having compassion, at the very least being able to take refuge, remember our objects of refuge, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, our spiritual teachers. So that's a positive state of mind, a virtuous state of mind. And if we can die with a virtuous state of mind, then one of our good karmic seeds will be the one that comes up and causes our next rebirth. So we want to make sure that our mind doesn't get caught up in any negative emotions at that time, which can happen. Um, sometimes people die angry. <laughs> they're angry that they're sick. They're angry that they're in pain. They're angry that they're dying. They're angry at the doctors or people in the room. So that would be really unfortunate to die with an angry state of mind. <clears throat> or any or attachment that's other another thing that can happen you feel a strong attachment to your loved ones your 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 things that you're leaving behind and so on i don't want to leave all this behind so that's also very unfortunate to die with attachment in our mind so to be able to have a greater possibility of dying with a positive state of mind rather than a negative one we have to learn how to work on our mind now so on a daily basis, it's really important to cultivate mindfulness, introspective alertness, watch our mind, be able to detect when afflictive emotions arise and deal with them. Get into the habit of applying antidotes to the afflictive emotions rather than just letting them run. Because if we let, if we have that kind of habit, then at the time of death, it's possible afflictive emotions could arise. And if we haven't learned how to handle them, then our mind just could get caught up and carried away. And that would be very unfortunate, could lead to an unfortunate rebirth. So that's something else that's really good to do now while we're alive. The third bullet point says, be mindful of feelings and try to prevent craving from arising. Because in the links, um, feeling arises from contact. So when we have um, contact with objects, like sense objects, things we see and so forth, then that gives rise to feeling. And, and uh, if, the, if the feeling is a pleasant feeling, if we're not careful, it can lead to attachment 
and craving and grasping. I want more of that pleasant object, more of that pleasant feeling. And so this increases our, habitua our habituation with craving. And if we have an unpleasant feeling towards an object, that can lead to um, aversion and that can develop further into anger, hatred, hostility, even wanting to do something harmful. So feeling is a really important mental factor. If we're not careful, then it can um, increase our familiarity with afflictive emotions, especially attachment and aversion. So it said that this is one of the places where we can start to break the, the 12 links. If we can learn to um, stop feeling from giving rise to craving, craving for more pleasant objects, craving to uh, separate from unpleasant objects and so on, then th th it's not easy to do. It does require a great deal of mindfulness and introspective alertness and practice. But one of the four foundations of mindfulness, which is a very, very important practice, um, especially in the Theravada tradition, um, one of those four foundations of mindfulness concerns feelings. So there you learn to pay attention to your feelings, observe your feelings, and gradually you can learn to um, stop the process of feeling, giving rise to craving. So that's another practice that can be done during our life. And then finally, listen to and study teachings on emptiness, because that, again, is the one and only antidote to ignorance. That is the only thing that will enable us to um, eliminate ignorance from our mind and stop this whole process of the 12 links and taking rebirth in samsara again and again. Yeah, and even if it's a difficult subject, yeah, most of us, well, I don't know about everybody, but I know myself and many other people, we spend years kind of in confusion trying to understand what emptiness is all about. Even the terminology can be very challenging to understand. But slowly, slowly, the more we listen to teachings, read about them, discuss them with our Dharma friends, think about them, meditate on, on them, slowly it starts to make more sense. So in that way, we're at least leaving imprints in our mind, seeds in our mind, um, that will enable us to eventually gain that wisdom realizing emptiness. Okay, so now moving on to the path to liberation. So up until now, we've been looking at samsara and um, all the different kinds of sufferings and problems found in samsara, like the six kinds of suffering, the three kinds of suffering, and so on. And then we looked at the causes of suffering, which are basically karma and afflictive emotions, especially ignorance. And the 12 links is also included in that, um, the, the cause of samsara. What is it that keeps us in samsara? Um, so now, hopefully, we do have a sense that samsara is a lousy place to be. <laughs> we want to get out. We don't want to continue being in samsara. We want to be free of samsara. So freedom from samsara means liberation, nirvana. And so that is a state in which we, one is free of all suffering and the very causes of suffering, ignorance, all the other afflictive emotions, karma. So one is free of all of those and one is able to just abide in a state of peace. Now, if we're following the Mahayana path, we don't want to just achieve nirvana and then hang out, you know, in this nice blissful state forever. <laughs> Our goal is enlightenment, becoming a Buddha to help all living beings. However, we still need to free ourselves from samsara in the sense of freeing ourselves from the afflictive emotions and karma um, so that we can help others, other beings, other sentient beings to do the same. 
But our goal is um, to follow the Bodhisattva's path and practice the six perfections and eventually become a fully enlightened Buddha to help all living beings. But even though that is our goal, we still do need to uh, generate renunciation, the determination to be free of samsara and free ourselves from samsara in the sense of um, making our minds free of the causes of samsara. So we still need to understand how to do that. So the path to liberation or nirvana mainly consists of um, three things, which are called the three higher trainings. Um, so these are higher training in ethics, in concentration, and in wisdom. And the term higher training um, refers to the motivation that one has for doing these practices, ethics, concentration, and wisdom. Um, the motivation is that of renunciation, the determination to be free. Having looked at samsara carefully and seen that samsara is uh, completely undesirable, unsatisfactory, horrible, in fact, and you just want to get out. And so if you have that understanding, that state of mind, and with that state of mind, you are practicing ethics, concentration, and wisdom, then, then it becomes the higher training of ethics, concentration, and wisdom. Otherwise, there are people who practice ethics or concentration or wisdom, but they don't have the motivation of of, of renunciation, determination to be free. Maybe they're just wanting to have a good rebirth in the next life. Thinking, oh, if I practice ethics, then in my next life, I can be born as a human being or maybe as a deva in one of the God realms. And um, that would be very nice, very blissful. So they're just thinking about a, a good future life. And so that isn't the higher training of ethics, but just ordinary ethics, just to clarify. So yeah, so there, you know, the different motivations that people may have for engaging in things like ethics or concentration or wisdom. So motivation is very important. And so of these three higher trainings, um, the main one, the most important one is the third one, the higher training in wisdom, because that's where we cultivate the wisdom that understands emptiness, the lack of inherent existence of ourself and everything else. Because again, that it's only that state of mind, that wisdom that is able to eliminate ignorance and enable us to be free of samsara. But it's not easy to develop wisdom. Um, it's a very difficult thing to understand. And um, if our mind is very um, mm, scattered <laughs> or, uh, you know, always running around here and there, not calm and peaceful and concentrated. So that state of mind, a scattered, uh, unsubdued state of mind makes it more difficult to develop wisdom. You need very good, strong concentration to be able to focus and uh, gain the wisdom realizing emptiness. So as a basis for wisdom, we need concentration. We need to be able to develop concentration. I mean, we can develop them side by side. It's not like we have to have perfect concentration first before we can develop wisdom, but we, we can't skip concentration. It, it, it's, it's an important foundation, important um, factor for developing wisdom. But then concentration is difficult as well. As, as we realize when we try to meditate and try to focus our mind on the breath or the image of the Buddha or any, any of the practices that we do, what we find is our mind is very, doesn't like to stay in one place for very long. It's always jumping here and there, past, future problems, work, and so on and so forth. And um, 
so one thing that makes concentration difficult is the way we behave, our behavior in our daily life. So if during our, I mean, probably the amount of time we spend meditating each day is relatively small compared to the other things that we do. Most of the time we're not meditating, we're running around doing things. And while we're running around doing things, if we get caught up in afflictive emotions and act them out, you know, act out attachment and anger and, uh, and pride and jealousy and so forth. So we're acting in ways that are um, unwise, unskillful, unvirtuous. And then when we sit down to meditate, that will make it even harder to concentrate because our mind is just turning away, maybe still feeling angry at the person <laughs> that upset us or, or feeling regret that we did get upset and you know, beating ourselves up and feeling guilty and so on. So there'll, there'll be a lot of, um, a lot of thoughts um, in our mind and, and, and emotions as well um, re related to unwise, unskillful things that we did during the day. And so then that makes it even more difficult to concentrate concentration becomes very, very difficult because we're still kind of processing all these things that happened to us during the day, some of which were not very positive or constructive. And so that's why ethics is very important, the first of the three higher trainings. Um, we'll go into ethics to look at what it actually means, what it actually involves. But basically, ethics has to do with our behavior, how we act. Um, you know, in our daily life, in our interactions with people, and the work that we do, and other activities that we do, and so on. So basically, it means trying to refrain from what is non-virtuous, what is unwise, what is unskillful with our body, and with our speech, and with our mind. So really trying to reduce as much as possible unvirtuous behavior. And if we do that, then when we sit down to meditate, there'll be fewer disturbances in our mind, making it difficult to, difficult to concentrate. So we'll be able to concentrate better. And with better concentration, our attempts to understand wisdom will improve as well. So that's why there's this kind of three-step process. Um, ethics is like the foundation. We need to have very good ethics on, on the basis of that. Then it becomes easier to develop concentration and on the basis of that uh, to develop wisdom. So in the Lam Rim, um, at this point in the Lam Rim, the, the three higher trainings are mentioned, but um, only ethics is really explained in detail because it said that the other two, concentration and wisdom, <clears throat> will be explained later in the context of the great scope. So when we finish the middle scope, we'll move on to the great scope, which is the bodhisattva's path, all about how to develop bodhicitta, um, and then practice the six perfections, which are the main practices of a bodhisattva who wants to attain uh, Buddhahood, full enlightenment to help all living beings. The last two of the six perfections are concentration and wisdom. <clears throat> so it's the same here, except there's a difference between the higher training and concentration and the perfection of concentration. The higher training of concentration is when you practice concentration to free yourself from samsara, to attain nirvana, liberation, just thinking of yourself, not thinking of all sentient beings. But in the bodhisattva's path, the perfection of concentration is when you're practicing concentration. So the practice is basically the same, but the motivation is different. So bodhisattva will practice concentration, not just to attain liberation from samsara, but to attain Buddhahood, to, be, to benefit all living beings. So anyway, the um, concentration and wisdom are explained in more detail um, in, the, in the great scope, in the context of the bodhisattva's path. 
<clears throat> so here we'll just look more at ethics, which already is a lot. <laughs> and again, this is a very important, essential foundation um, for the other two, for concentration and wisdom. So um, it's good in the beginning to understand the benefits of ethics, how, how beneficial it is to have good ethics and how um, disadvantageous it is it, if we don't have good ethics. So being able to weigh the, the pros and cons. If I have good ethics, this is what will happen. If I don't have good ethics, this is what will happen. And then hopefully we'll feel, um, we'll feel uh, the, you know, strong wish to have good ethics, seeing its benefits. So first of all here, there's a, a kind of definition or explanation of what is ethics in Buddhism. I suppose in, you know, in the world, there are different meanings of ethics. Ethics will mean different things to different people. Um, so this is, you know, according to Buddhism, ethics is the quality of mind that restrains or protects us from committing physical, verbal, and mental actions that are negative or non-virtuous. Okay, so, so ethics is mainly a state of mind. It's an attitude of mind. And it's that, that this attitude in the mind that feels, I don't want to do non-virtuous actions, negative actions with my body, with my speech, with my mind. <clears throat> so how we get to that state of mind, how we develop that state of mind, that attitude that says, I don't want to do what is non-virtuous, is mainly by understanding the consequences of non-virtuous actions. So we already did look at that to a certain extent in the small scope, in the section on karma. Um, Non-virtue is what leads to suffering. That's, that's, that's the criteria for whether an action is virtuous or non-virtuous. Um, it's, it's what kind of result, kind of effect, consequence will come. So non-virtuous actions are those that lead to suffering to pain, to problems, to bad experiences, especially being born in one of the unfortunate realms, being born as an animal or as a hungry ghost or a hell being. So that's the probably the greatest, the most severe um, negative consequence, suffering consequence of, of a negative action, a non-virtuous action. But, you know, it doesn't stop there. There are other painful consequences of non-virtuous actions that can um, occur even when we're in a fortunate rebirth, like as a human being. So as we can see right now in the world, there's so many sufferings, so many problems like COVID, still many people getting sick from COVID, dying from COVID or many other kinds of diseases as well, like cancer and heart disease, so many diseases. And, um, and then there's wars and there's poverty and there's um, hunger and homelessness and injustice. And so all these problems, even though human, you know, the human realm is um, considered a fortunate place to be born generally, good to be born as a human being, but even as a human being, there can be terrible experiences. Not as bad as the lower realms. I mean, they say whatever happens in the human realm is, is mild, is light compared to um, the other realms, especially hell. That's the worst place of all. But still is bad, terrible um, experiences encountered by human beings. So these are also the result of negative karma, non-virtuous karma. Yeah, so even when we have a headache or we have a stomach ache or we get the flu or it's a bit too hot or a bit too cold or we have to go a bit longer than we would like without food or whatever, you know, these little 
problems that can arise during our daily life. So these are the result of, of um, non-virtuous actions or negative actions with body, speech, and mind. Um, and then virtuous actions. Virtuous actions are actions that bring happiness within samsara. So being born as a human being, um, having uh, good health, having resources, enough to eat, things that we need, having a comfortable place to live, having nice weather, being in a nice environment. So the pleasant things that we can experience in our, in our life, these are the result of, of uh, virtuous actions. So it's important to um, yeah, have an understanding of karma and how our actions, the actions that we do with our body, with our speech and our mind are the cause for the results, the consequences, the experiences that we have and become convinced of that. It's, it's not easy to do because we can't see, we cannot have our own direct experience of how karma works. You do an action at one point in time and it leads to this result at another point in time. Um, the Buddha was able to see that and those who develop their minds further along the path are also able to see how karma works. They can see it directly. So in the meantime, we just need to um, rely on the Buddha's the Buddha's uh, wisdom. Although Lama Yeshi would say to us, um, you know, that we can, to a certain extent, see the results of karma just in, in one day. You know, if we have a, a bad state of mind, we're in a bad mood, we're feeling gr grumpy and grouchy and negative and eh, like that, <laughs> how that state of mind will affect the experiences that we have. And, and also the, the way we interpret our experiences, you know, and, and I'm sure we can all see examples of this, you know, when you're in a, in a bad state of mind, um, even some small thing goes wrong and you can get so upset about it, so angry, so depressed, so negative. Whereas when you're in a good state of mind, when you're feeling happy and positive, then little things don't bother you. You can continue to be happy and positive, and even big things you're able to manage without getting depressed and angry. So by looking at our mind, our state of mind, and how that affects the experiences that we have, I mean, it's not exactly karma, but just to see how our mind does play a role, a very important role, a huge role, in our experiences can open us up more to the Buddhist teachings on karma, which basically say everything's created by our own mind. Our mind is the main creator, the main source of both happiness and suffering. So looking at our own experiences, looking at the experiences of others in the world around us can help us be more open, more accepting of the teachings on karma and the role that our mind plays. So anyway, the more we contemplate that and hopefully get convinced of that, we will have more interest and more determination to live ethically, to have this concern about how we behave and really try to refrain from doing things that are negative or non-virtuous. And then, again, it's helpful to look at the benefits of ethics. If we do have good ethics, good ethical conduct, then the benefits include happiness in this life and in our future lives, because we're creating the cause for fortunate rebirths and fortunate experiences rather than unfortunate ones. And, and in this life, it's said that the results of most of the results of karma don't ripen in the same lifetime, but you know, in future lives. But still, we can see some benefit because, as I mentioned before, you know, if we do unwise, unskillful, harmful actions, our mind feels agitated. We feel regret. We feel bad. 
And so it, it's harder to have a peaceful, positive state of mind if we're engaging in unwholesome, unvirtuous actions. So when we are behaving more wisely and virtuously, and our mind is more at peace and more happy and our relationships with others go, go better as well. So there is happiness in this life from having good ethics. And also there's many quotations in the sutras about how ethics is the foundation of all good qualities. If we wanna develop compassion and love and wisdom and all the good qualities and all the realizations of the path, then um, we need ethics as the foundation of that. So those are some of the benefits and the disadvantages of not practicing ethics are the opposite. So if we don't have good ethics, if we're careless or sloppy about our ethics, we do non-virtuous actions, then there'll be suffering in this life, in our future lives, unfortunate rebirths, and also it's said that we'll have difficulty in our future lives, maybe this life as well, difficulties meeting spiritual teachers and having access to spiritual teachings. There'll be more obstacles to achieving that and to attaining realizations. So if we want to achieve these realizations of calm abiding, wisdom realizing emptiness, liberation, enlightenment, then we're, we're, if we don't have good ethics, we're creating obstacles, creating hindrances to attaining those. So these are just some of the points, but there's more found in the teachings on the benefits of ethics. So good to contemplate these and hopefully we'll come to the point where we feel, yes, ethics is important something I want to put my energy into. So the next slide is how to practice ethics. What does it mean to practice ethics? So the first thing we need to do is refrain from the 10 non-virtues as much as we can. So that was already explained in a small scope, the 10 non-virtuous actions. So learning about those and trying to be mindful in our daily life, to refrain from doing those. And if we do create any of those non-virtues, it's not the end of the world, because we have the practice of purification with the four powers that we can use to purify. But it's better if we can avoid creating them in the first place and not think, oh, never mind, I can purify, so I'll go and do this non-virtuous action, then afterwards I'll do purification. That's like saying, you know, it's okay to go and break your leg because you can go to the hospital and get it fixed up. Yeah, but it'll never be quite the same. <laughs> it's better to try to refrain from doing them in the first place. And in the book, um, The Easy Path, uh, Geshe, <laughs> I have trouble with his name, Gyumi Kenser Lofsung Jampa, who gave, the, gave these teachings, um, he suggests using the golden rule. I mean, he doesn't use that term golden rule, but we all know the golden rule. Don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you or do to others what you would want them to do to you. So yeah, he says, if you think about how you would feel if someone tried to kill you or steal your things, or uh, lie to you, or speak harsh words to you, that you wouldn't like that kind of behavior, and then apply that to others. <clears throat> Understand that they don't want to be treated in those ways. So he says, use empathy to refrain from doing harmful actions to others, just as you wouldn't want others to do those things to you. And then the next um, bullet point says, take pratimoksha precepts. Pratimoksha is a Sanskrit term. It means individual liberation. So there's um, precepts or vows, sometimes they're called vows, that can be taken for life. As a lay person, you can take the five lay precepts, and you don't even have to take all five. You can 
take one or two or three or four, as many as you can manage. Um, so they are to refrain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, um, lying, and taking intoxicants. So usually at the time of taking refuge, when you um, decide to make a commitment to being a Buddhist, following the Buddhist path, you usually have the option of taking one or more of those five precepts, and they're taken for life. And um, it's good to take precepts. Um, it's more powerful than just saying, I'm not going to kill, you know, I'm just trying to live like that. I mean, of course, that's excellent, you know, to try to live in a nonviolent way, not harm other beings. But taking the precept to refrain from killing, you're making a promise to the Buddha. You, you, you go through a ceremony with a teacher and you promise the Buddha and all the holy beings, holy objects, that you will keep this vow. So it's kind of more powerful. It makes a stronger impression on your mind than just deciding on your own that you're not going to do that. And also, it said that if you do take a, a precept or a number of precepts, it um, they, they become part of your mind. There's something actually there in your mind that's continuously creating virtue. <laughs> 24 hours a day, even when you're asleep, virtue is being accumulated by the presence of those precepts in your mind. So it's a very powerful way of uh, creating more virtue, more cause of happiness. And then there's also precepts that can be taken by monastics, different levels of those. So this is for those who feel strongly enough to, to take that on. It's usually good to learn the Dharma and practice the Dharma for, for a while before making that kind of um, decision. But anyway, as a lay person, you can take these five lay precepts, and that's a really good thing to do. That's part of the practice of ethics. And then there's the eight Mahayana precepts that, that can be taken for 24 hours. Um, so it's good to learn about those. I'm sure most people have learned about them and have practiced them, but that's something you take from a teacher. So that's just a 24-hour period where you're keeping precepts. And that's very good. It gives you, you know, a strong taste of, of living a more pure lifestyle just for a short period of time. And then there's also bodhisattva precepts and tantric precepts. So, but this is, you know, a more advanced level. So these are all included in ethics. These are all part of ethics, different levels, different stages. Um, and then the next slide, um, this is really important. If we uh, do uh, take on the practice of ethics, there's what are called the four doors to downfalls or transgressions, meaning I kind of have this picture in my mind of a door that you open and there's this very steep set of steps stairs that you could fall down <laughs> into the cellar. <laughs> so these are doors that can lead us to making mistakes or breaking vows, breaking precepts, doing non-virtuous things. So we need to be aware of these, these four doors, and there are antidotes to them that we need to apply. So the first door is not knowing, meaning um, not knowing, like, it sounds kind of unbelievable, but it sometimes happens that people take precepts and they don't really understand what's involved in that precept. And then they go and break it because they didn't, they didn't um, study it and learn, you know, what, what it is they've taken on. Um, so we, we do need to make an effort to know precepts that we've taken and what and what constitutes breaking them and keeping them. And then also with the non-virtuous actions, you know, what's, what, what does it mean to do those non-virtuous actions? What's involved in killing and stealing and so forth? So we need to educate ourselves. Um, so we need to learn and study about what is non-virtue 
and what is virtue to be able to make sure that we avoid non-virtue and practice virtue. So the antidote to that then is learning and study. <clears throat> and the second door is lack of respect. And this can mean not respecting our teacher. Uh, may, not, I guess not everyone has a teacher, but <laughs> um, ideally, if we want to follow the path, develop ourselves on the path to enlightenment, we do need to have at least one teacher that we um, take teachings from and we can ask advice and so on. But this could also include lack of respect for um, the Buddha and his teachings. He's like the ultimate teacher, the original teacher. Um, so lack of respect for the Buddha, his teachings, and also lack of respect for our companions, for our spiritual friends. Sometimes they know better than we do. They're wiser than us, or they have more experience than we do. That if we don't have respect for any of these objects, our teacher, our spiritual friends, the Buddha, then we won't pay attention to their advice. We'll just, we'll just have this thought in our mind, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Or, I don't have to do that. I know better than them. Something like that. So a lack of respect can lead us to um, doing, creating non-virtue, breaking precepts, and so on. Uh, so as a remedy to that, the antidote to that is to build up feeling of respect. And we do that by contemplating the good qualities of the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, spiritual teachers, spiritual friends, um, companions. Um, so if we do ever notice that our respect is starting to decline and we're starting to get more critical and judgmental and negative and having thoughts and feelings like, I don't want to pay attention to them, I don't want to do what they say, <laughs> then we need to take care of that and um, remember their good qualities. And don't expect them to be perfect. That, that's a problem that sometimes happens. You know, We have high expectations of our spiritual teachers or spiritual companions. And if we do see fault, if we see them uh, making mistakes or having faults, then that might cause us to lose respect. So we have to, you know, we have to accept that they are human beings too. Then they don't have to be perfect in order to be um, helpful to us, to be guides for us. As long as they know more than we do, they have more experience than we do. And if what they're saying is wise and and um, worth following, then that's that's good enough. And the third is lack of conscientiousness. So conscientiousness is a virtuous mental factor that um, enables us to just pay attention to what we're doing and keep ourselves on track, keep, you know, make sure that we're staying on the right track, the track of virtue, the track of good ethics. And um, lack of conscientiousness is also called recklessness, being reckless, being uncareful, not careful, but just, ah, I don't care what I do, just, yeah. <laughs> you say it's like being like a wild elephant. Or what's that expression? A bull in a china shop. <laughs> just making a lot of mistakes, causing a lot of problems. So there's four antidotes to this. These are mental factors. Mindfulness. So mindfulness can have different meanings. One is, one meaning of mindfulness is just paying attention to what we are doing with our body, with our speech, with our mind. Another meaning of mindfulness is um, keeping in mind our precepts. So if we have taken the precept, not forgetting that you took that precept, remembering that you took that precept, remembering what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. Um, so keeping that in mind without forgetting it. 
And vigilance, or another translation for that is introspective awareness. So this is compared to a spy, but a good spy, <laughs> um, watching the mind and just checking, you know, what's going on and is it doing the right thing or not? So this is the factor that enables us to recognize, to notice um, if we are getting caught up in something non-virtuous. And the third is integrity, which is a, a virtuous mental factor. It's sometimes also called self-respect. Um, the book explains that you value and care enough about yourself that you won't do unethical things. Yeah, so it's a sense of respect. I am a Buddhist, I am a nun, I am a Buddhist practitioner, and um, I've taken on this practice to follow the path to enlightenment, to follow the path to virtue, to be a good person, to you know, follow what the Buddha said. And someone like me wouldn't do that kind of thing. <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be right, I just wouldn't feel right to go and do that kind of thing non-virtuous action. So that's meaning of integrity. And the fourth is consideration for others. This is another mental factor that can stop us from doing things that are unwise or unskillful or non-virtuous, but it's more out of considering others, such as our teachers or the Buddha or our spiritual friends. Like, you know, they would not be happy with me if I were to do such a thing. And we can all, it can also include, you know, thinking that it would be a bad example. You know, I would be a bad example to others if I were to do that kind of thing. So those four mental factors, I'm rushing a bit because we're running out of time, but those four enable us to have conscientiousness and carefulness about our behavior rather than recklessness. And the fourth door is having many strong delusions or afflictive emotions. So if we have a lot of attachments and a lot of anger and aversion and so on, and other afflictive emotions, then that can endanger our precepts, endanger our ethics. So again, we need to watch our mind, notice when they arise and then apply antidotes. So we looked a little Earlier, we looked at some of the antidotes to the main afflictive emotions, but there's a lot more in the teaching. So we need to um, learn those, train in those, so that when afflictions do arise, we're ready for them and we know how to deal with them. So we should try our best to live ethically and have good ethical conduct, but we shouldn't do this in a fanatical uptight way, like thinking, I can't make the slightest mistake. If I make the slightest mistake, I'm a horrible person. I'm, I'm a failure, beep, beep, beep. You know, that, that doesn't help. And it's better to think these are trainings. These are things that I'm learning and training and I'm gonna make mistakes, it's inevitable. And when we do make mistakes, it's good to feel regret and then do purification, um, talk to your teacher, talk to your spiritual friends. That's, that's helpful to get advice from them and then just try to do better the next time. But yeah, as long as we're human beings, we're not enlightened beings. <laughs> that's why we need these practices because we, we need to train. We're still working on ourselves. Okay, so there's just one more slide, but uh, yeah, I won't go through this. It's just a summary of the middle scope. Um, we've come to the end of the middle scope, and it basically can be summarized in the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, suffering exists, many different kinds of suffering. And there are causes of suffering, mainly karma and delusions, and especially ignorance. But the good news is, we can be free of suffering. That's the third noble truth. There's a cessation of suffering and the causes of suffering. And then the fourth is the path. There's a path leading to that, which is these four, I mean, these three higher trainings, starting with ethics. So 
Yeah, there's a lot of material in this part of the Lum Room, and it's very important material. So I encourage you to read more and study more, learn more, and, um, and start practicing, at least with this point of ethics, good ethics, trying to have good ethics as much as possible. So this is the last session for this part of the course, and we have a break now until October. We'll start again on October the 7th. And in that last section, we'll cover the great scope, which is the Bodhisattva's path, really beautiful, how to develop Bodhicitta, practice the six perfections, create the causes to become a Buddha. <clears throat> okay, so I hope that wasn't too rushed and you <laughs> made sense of some of that. And so we'll now dedicate the merit, the positive energy we've created to all living beings, to their enlightenment and to the long lives of our spiritual teachers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, <clears throat> may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish-fulfilling, wish-granting jewel, source of every benefit and happiness in this world, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. <clears throat> <clears throat>